I had a very, very big identity crisis that year. Um, just trying to figure out, cause that became my identity. That was how people knew me was the gymnast that kind of in, in some regards changed to SARS. But then when you step in with the big boys, it's a whole new, it's a whole new game. You know, my dad was working for, you know, a financial company and got caught up in a Ponzi scheme. Oh, wow. And ended up, uh, going to prison. How old were you when he went to jail or I, to prison? I was, uh, seven at the time. Okay. He, he showed me that it's never too late to, to, to put in the effort and you really put life on hold for a long time. So you have to really, you have to be driven and you have to have a, a vision of where you want to go or else you, you, you won't survive. And I think taking that into business has been so natural for me because I've, I've done this for almost, you know, I did it for, you know, 17 years. What's going on, everybody? My name is Ryan Snod. It rhymes with odd, and you're listening to watching the Rhymes with Odd podcast. Today, we're welcomed by another amazing guest in the studio. We got Spencer Johnson in the house. Spencer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Awesome, man. So Spencer is the owner of Emerge Academy here in Grimes, just a short stone's throw, not a stone's throw, but a five minute drive away from the studio here, um, which is, a, I would say, like a gymnastics gym, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Gymnastics and Ninja Warrior. Very cool. So yep. we'll, we'll talk about all the stuff that you guys do there, but um, you have an amazing story that I really want to kind of dig into on this show, which is kind of your journey through uh, gymnastics, the process through that. And then also, uh, American Ninja warrior and all the, all the fun things that go with the athletic side that has then turned into a business for you now. So really excited to dig in that with you today. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So before we kind of get too far in the weeds, um, I, what I always t tell people, like, tell me, how do you introduce yourself to someone? Like if someone asks you who you are and what you do? Um, well, I usually just start with my name, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, I talk about, uh, I own a gym, gymnastics, ninja warrior, work with kids basically from walking, you know, to, uh, I think my oldest, uh, student on my adult fitness class is, uh, I call my adult ninjas is 58. So there's a wide variety. I primarily work with kids between, I'd say the youngest being seven and the oldest, uh, being 18. That's what I do for the most part. But, um, but yeah, I love what I do. Uh, we're, uh, you know, a national team training center. And, and, uh, also we take adults that want to stay active, that don't know how to work out, don't know how to go to a gym They're It's just kind of intimidating and I get them on a good path and, and I love it. I love what I do. Sure. That's awesome. I think it's really cool too, just how Ninja Warriors has exploded in the last, yeah. like what, 10 years or oh, so. Yeah. It's, it's like, wild. I mean, it went from being just a TV show that we'd binge watch on TV to now there's like multiple places in the Metro that offer kind of like ninja-esque training facilities for kids and for adults. It's kind of a wild, wild thing now. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's so funny cause it's literally, there's not really any major staple to it. Um, other than like the warped wall. Uh, but it's like a, it's like a giant playground. So mm -hmm. for people that are just not quite ready to be an adult and grow up like myself. It's perfect. Sure. You know, I can work around and, and fly around and do all sorts of silly things and, and I'm right at home. Sure. Well, I think even just having the diversity of uh, interest and in, in exercise is super important because even as a guy that was just a classic commercial gym person for 15 years and then I was like, I need to change. Like, so I did cross it for a while and then I'm going to do it a different place now. It's like, you need different things to keep your, your juices flowing, you know? Oh yeah. Cause it's like, if you just show up to a gym and do the same workout, walking a treadmill or running a treadmill for five days a week, it's like, it's kind of soul sucking, right? Oh, you, absolutely. You need some yeah. fun in your <laughs> exercise re routine. Keep it fun, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. It's, it's so funny. Yeah. The type of people that we get into is there's just no rhyme or reason, you know, people just sometimes just need to be met where they're at. And so the workouts that we do are just, they're, they're fun and they're different every time. There's never, there's never really the same one ever. And, uh, just people come in and they, you, you know, you get what you put into it. But, uh, but we, we just get excited about all the little things. So some people it's like, well, they've never done a pull up before, or they can't do one, you know, and we, we work on that and we do, they do the class and then eventually they get a pull up and, and we make a big, ridiculous amount of, uh, a, dig, a ridiculous scene about it because it's, it's fun and it's exciting and that's a milestone for somebody. So it's just, I think it's just celebrating where everybody's at. Everybody's pushing for something. And so they come in and even if it's a small feat for somebody, it's a big feat for them. And we just, we just get excited. So it's, we're, we're just a hodgepodge group of people that are, are, uh, just, 
cheering and working out. You know, it's just people looking in, they'd be like, who are those hooligans in there? That's crazy. Sure, sure. So, yeah, I think that will be, we'll, we'll definitely talk more about Emerge mm-hmm. in a second because I think it's just a, such a unique offer in the marketplace with just place to be for adults, young people, all that type of stuff. I know when we first met, um, we ended up working together because I needed a location for a, a shoot. So that was yeah. kind of how we first got connected. Um, so I got to see your space and it was just kind of cool. Like it's, I would say it's like a, like a warehouse flex space that got converted into like a, a gymnastics uh-huh. uh, factory. It's kind of like a Rob Deerdick's fantasy yeah. factory without, <laughs> without the uh, skate ramps. It's yeah. more like uh, n- Ninja Warrior stuff everywhere. So yeah. 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 It was really cool. We were really lucky to be, uh, to find that location. You know, Grimes was just really just a, a hot spot that was just growing. And, um, and it, we were one of the first tenants. So it was like a big, uh, it's kind of like a big puzzle piece. You know, you have it laid out and then you find out or you figure out where, where you need certain things. And then you put together this, this dream that you think is it's, it's so 2d, you know, you're just looking at it on paper. And then as it started to come together, it's just, it was an, it's an overwhelming experience. It's just, it was really, really neat. So we're really fortunate to have it. That's awesome. Kind of going back in your backstory, I think it would be beneficial to hear a little bit about like where you're from and kind of your roots and and how you got to where you are today. So let's start from the very beginning. Like where'd you grow up and we can kind of go from there. Yeah. So I grew up in a little town called Van Meter. Um, and, uh, I think it was about, uh, maybe 3000 at that time. Uh, it's grown, I know substantially since then, but, um, we just, uh, had this little, uh, little tiny house. It was six of us, you know, my, both my parents and I have three siblings and uh, our middle child, youngest, oldest, I'm uh, second oldest. So I have an older brother and two little sisters. Okay. And, um, so it was, uh, and, and it was, it's a small house. We just had one floor and then an unfinished basement. And, uh, you know, we had just, I mean, we had no money. We were just very, very, very poor growing up. Um, and I say that in, um, you know, relatively speaking, I know there's places, you know, that have, that we were very fortunate to have what we had and we were thankful for that. So growing up, I didn't feel like we didn't have a lot of money. Um, but we just, we were very much, we lived off of very, very little, you know, no AC growing up. We had no cable, you know, we had a little tiny TV, you know, with the, with the antennas and the foil on top, who knew, who knew if that actually worked, but you know, we did that. You had to be the first one up on Saturday morning to get to choose one of the three channels, yep. you know? So, um, but we, but we loved it. We really, it was, it was a special place. We played around outside all the time. And, um, but we just, yeah, like I said, we just did not have a, a lot of money and I was definitely the most hyper kid in the house. And so a lot of times my mom would be like, Hey, you got to go run laps around the house. You know what I mean? Five laps. I'm like, what? She's like five laps. How Take fast a lap. Do you do it? Yeah. Take yeah. a lap. So I'm like, all right, all right. <laughs> She'd it's be a, a hell of a coach. Oh yeah. Take a yeah. lap. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So I'd just be sprinting around all the time and um, so eventually they were like, we got to do something with this kid. He's just crazy. He's flipping off of things. He's going to break his neck. And so they put me in gymnastics and, uh, man, it just really took off from there. That's really cool. Well, and I think it's, I mean, a lot of, I mean, I feel like a lot of young boys have just a ton of energy, but mm-hmm. were you doing like WWE moves, but you oh, don't even yeah. know WWE because oh, yeah. you didn't have a channel. So it's yeah. like <laughs> just jumping off, like tackling people or oh, doing yeah. whatever you could think of. So I want to say I, I invented several moves that, uh, probably have never been seen before jumping off the couch onto my brother or sisters. You know what I mean? Just total classics that just were never unveiled. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. You're like stone Cold's <laughs> coming in hot. And like, <laughs> I saw something oh, on the yeah. radio ad. <laughs> like, what is happening? Um, so you, you get into gymnastics. What what age was this? Was this like you were like elementary school age? Or? So I was actually nine, and uh, which was pretty late for a lot of a lot of gymnasts to start. Um, which sounds crazy. Mm-hmm. You're not even yeah. like ten yet. But I know that's it's just it, it's weird. But yeah, started when I was nine, and it was. I remember there was one kid in uh, I believe his name was Sam, and he was the kid that the coach always used to demonstrate. Um, a certain gymnastics move. He's like, all right, here's what we're going to do guys. This is what it looked like. And it was probably like a forward roll or maybe a cartwheel or something. I was like, man, I gotta be that. I gotta, I gotta beat Sam. You know, that kid is, that kid is good. You know what I mean? And so, um, I just really started working hard at it. It was the one thing I feel like in my life that I felt like I was excelling at, you know, otherwise I was getting in trouble all the time. I was running around. I was loud. I was obnoxious. And this was like, Hey, this kid's good. You know what I mean? So, uh, as, as I kept going back, I started getting better and slowly the coach started using me more until I was that guy, you know, and then I would get moved up and I made a competitive team. And all of a sudden it was like, wow, there was, 
I have new Sam now. There's other Sams out there. I was like, man, I got to beat them. And I wanted to be the best in the state. And then pretty soon I was state champion. But then it was like, hey, now we're going to regional championships. And there's kids that are better than you yeah, from other states. I kept finding Sam. There was <laughs> always more Sams. I couldn't escape Sam. You know what I mean? It slowly just built and built and built. And then finally I made it to the U.S. Olympic Training Center. And then Sam was now the rest of the world. Sure. You know what I mean? So it was just, it was, uh, it was a really, really, I had a phenomenal experience. I chased it till the 2012 Olympics, missed the team, and uh, but I was close, and I had a really, really fortunate run, um, and I just knew at that time it was, I was not recovering as fast as a lot of the younger guys coming up, and I knew it was time to hang it up. Sure. Well, as you're kind of growing up, I mean, gymnastics is such a uh, unique sport to just jump into. Did you ever try like an, your more traditional team sports like uh, football, basketball, baseball, so something I, like that? Yeah. So I loved basketball. I was really, um, I was really obsessed with basketball. You know, the the, the Bulls. Scotty Pippen was probably my favorite player. I don't even know why. I just loved Scotty Pippen. I think I loved that he was uh, that he could score, but he was also known to like feed it to Jordan. You know what I mean? I just thought, what a cool position that he was. You know, Michael Jordan, obviously, everybody loved Michael Jordan. You know what I mean? But but Mike wouldn't have been as big unless he had someone dishing with, it to him like Pippen. Pippen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and then you had Rodman, who was rebounding, and together they were like the triple threat. You know what I mean? So it was like, yeah, I was obsessed. I, I had basketball cards, but, you know, I was I was tiny. I was like 1% on the growth chart, you know what I mean, for, for a while. They thought I was going to be like, they were like, you're going to be like 5'1". You know, somehow I got to be five seven. Not sure how, but anyways, it was. I was always kind of tiny, and you know, we 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 had some we had some issues in in the home as well. You know, my dad was working for you know a financial company and got caught up in a Ponzi scheme. Oh wow! And ended up uh, going to prison. Oh my gosh! And so, which is just was was pretty tough. So my mom was alone with us for a little while. How old were you when he went to jail or I, to prison? I was uh, seven at the time. Okay. And so, so even before gymnastics then, mm -hmm. so you didn't even have this like productive outlet to like right. you yeah. know, get that energy out, you know? So I was definitely struggling with, you know, as a, as a child, just to figure things out. And, uh, you know, eventually, you know, when my dad came out, he was a different person. Um, and that's a whole nother story in itself. But it, he really showed me what it meant to, you know, practically lose everything and then work himself uh, back into, you know, uh, being a good father, being a good husband and being a business owner. Eventually he owned his own business, uh, several sold them and started a nonprofit. And that's, I mean, I have so much respect for him and he really did. He, he showed me that it's never too late to, to, to put in the effort. But because of that, there obviously was some dysfunction that we had in that. And I felt like, you know, everywhere else where I was getting in trouble, gymnastics was an outlet. It became more and more and more, you know, when I was doing it, you know, it's, it progressively got to 12 hours a week, then to 20 hours a week, and then eventually like 30, 35 hours a week. So it was like, there was nothing that could keep up with me. I felt like at that time, uh, I needed something fast paced to drive towards, to kind of stay away from all the actual issues that we were having at that point in time. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No. And I think it's, it's so, so interesting because these hardships shaped you into the athlete you were. And it's like, like you said, you have these, these role models, good and bad scene, like redemption, all these things. Like it, it builds that mindset of like, like you said, I can beat Sam. And then you keep going and yeah. going. And then you see like other people in your life or other teammates that are like, well, they're doing cool stuff. Like I can do that too. Or I can, you know, I can learn from those things as when he went, how long was he in prison for? Was it like a, a chunk of time or your, so, the rest of your childhood? Yeah. Nope. So he ended up getting, uh, he was supposed to get five years and then people like in his community. I mean, my dad was pretty, uh, you know, had good favor with a lot of people. Um, we were attending a, or like a really small church at that time. So people from that congregation and then people in our, our friend circle all showed up to the courtroom and we just had a public defender, you know, because that's, Couldn't afford yeah, a lawyer. Yeah, afford, yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So we found this guy yeah. in the alley. He's, <laughs> hey, he's uh, do you got a suit? No, nope. yeah. that's it's all like, right. Come on Gilmore, yeah. the, the caddy that's like <laughs> just the guy with cleaning windows from the parking yeah, lot. <laughs> exactly. So it's just, it was just wild. And they said, they were like, um, you know, so many people showed up and the guy said, the defender said, you know, listen, uh, first step in recovery is just accountability is confessing and accountability. And he's like, I mean, look around the, the accountability he's got in this room alone 
speaks volumes. And so they ended up, uh, the judge said, you know, I probably shouldn't do this, but, um, I'm going to give you six months and then two years of house arrest. So, uh, so really got to love when a judge prefaces a sentence yeah. with probably shouldn't do this. Like, and you're like yes. 30 years yeah. in prison or six <laughs> yeah, months. Which way is it going? It's like it's going yeah. one or the other. So, yeah. oh man. So we were very fortunate, you know, in that regards, but, um, but it was hard. I mean, it was really, really hard. I mean, you can imagine, uh, you know, on my mom's side, she's, you know, felt abandoned and, uh, you know, had four kids, me being the, the small terror that I was, uh, added, like I was basically like three kids and, um, all on my own, but, uh, you know, so they had some rebuilding to do in their relationship. Um, I had some rebuilding I had to do with, you know, my father and, and the other, my other siblings as well. So, you know, it took a big toll on our family, but it also made us who we are today. And, uh, the coolest thing is, you know, my dad now, uh, sort of a super success, he had a super successful cleaning company because when he got to prison, just a little side note, he had to, they said, you got to choose a job because if you don't, you're gonna be shoveling snow. And it was in, uh, uh, North Dakota. So you can imagine the snow that they get there. So he's like, okay, well, I guess I'll do cleaning. I don't really know much about it. Um, but so he started doing that. So when he got out, he started pursuing cleaning and then opened his own uh, janitorial company that took off and uh, which he ended up selling to start a nonprofit uh, downtown that is for people coming out of prison that just to help them get jobs. Oh, my gosh. You know what I mean? what's, so, what's the name of the, the nonprofit? It's uh, called Change Course. Okay. Change course, yeah. So it's really, it's he, he's on, his story is remarkable. It's really, really cool, and I really am very blessed to be a part of that because, like I said, it I got to see firsthand what when something's taken away from you, how he easily could have just said, "I'm going to be done." My mom could have said, "You know, I'm not going to fight for this." You know what I mean? But together, both of them said, "This is this can be the beginning of change for us," and they did it. They pursued it and because of that. I was able to see you know, starting a business, there's been times where it's like, this isn't going to work. I mean, heck, we started it and then COVID happened, a a, a global pandemic. You know what I mean? It's like, what am I doing? But I got to see people lose, lose it all, have no money, then go in major, major debt and see them fight back to, to pursue the American dream. You know what I mean? And so that really changed my perspective to see that there is, it's never, there's never a bottom line that you can't come above, you know what I mean? In my experience now, and, and, and once again, I know there's all facets of life. I know that everybody comes from something, something different, but for me, I was able to see firsthand that it's never too late. Sure. Well, and just seeing again, hitting rock bottom and in the attitude that yeah. it's the only thing you can really affect, right? Is like, how do you cope, cope with it? Come, yeah. you get, overcome it. That type of stuff is super interesting. As we're, as you're kind of seeing these things happen at home and all the stuff with gymnastics, at what point did you realize that you could go to the next level with the gymnastics? You mentioned you became the, the, um, demonstrator in yeah, practice yeah, squad. Yeah. At what point did you realize like, okay, I'm like, I'm, I have self-realization to know, like I could go to the next level and do this and make a career out of it or make, you yeah. know, get a, a college education out of this. I think when people started talking about it, um, you know, in the state, people started recognizing me for, this was the first time I was recognized as somebody that wasn't, uh, you know, uh, ADHD, you know, hyper kid, you know what I mean? Obviously school was, I struggled in school a lot. I'm also dyslexic. So it was like, there was, and there wasn't really anything for a, a hyper dyslexic kid at that time. You know, there just wasn't, especially in a small town like that. So um, this was, it, it was a place where I was getting recognized for something I was doing very well. And I, I loved that. I thrived on it. You know what I mean? So the state, people in the state started talking about it, you know, in, in our community, our respective community. Um, and then, uh, and then regionally, uh, people started to know my name, you know, and then, uh, and then nationally, when I started to get, I think when I stepped into the national platform and I was in that top group, then I started, I was like, oh, this just got real. You know what I mean? Like, this is, this is what I want to do. But, um, I, I think, I think really this sounds hilarious, but I think really one of the turning points was when I was pretty young, still pursuing it. I saw the Disney movie Hercules you know what I mean? And that, and he's like, sing that song. I can go the distance. You know, I don't care how far, you know what I mean? And I was just like, yes, <laughs> I'm Hercules. You know what yeah. I mean? I was like, that could be me. So that was kind of became my theme track, you know, for what I wanted to do. And so then I just had decided, um, I'm going to make the Olympic team. 
You know what I mean? I said, that's what I'm going to chase. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give up pursuing that, but it did not come without hardships. You know, when I was 14, the gym that I was training at, and it was the only gym in Iowa at the time that had a boys program, dropped their boys program. So, and you know, obviously as, as you know, now we had no money. So it was like, well, I can move away from home and, or I can quit. And it was like, it was really, there was no option. Yeah. There's one option and it was just, I was going to move away from home. So I did, I lived with, uh, I've lived with probably, or no, I've lived with eight different host families and, uh, I've lived in, uh, four different States. And, um, but that's what took me to the Olympic training center. So I, I kind of had to grow up pretty, pretty young too. I think that's why that's definitely contributed to me being able to be successful in in business too, is because I just didn't really have a choice. So I think, uh, so then when, when I was, uh, when I graduated high school, I, I was at a training camp in Tennessee and I, my career was going pretty well. And I remember the coach, the head coach of the Olympic training center was coming to that camp. And I, so my goal was to impress him so much to the point that he would let me take a spot on his team. And, uh, at this point I had had some interest in colleges, um, they, you know, I, I had some scholarship offers, but, uh, I had one question for those college coaches. I said, if you had the right athlete, could you take him to the Olympics? And based on how they would not like, Hey, so what's your, uh, what's your math programs look like? What, tell me about business here. You know what I mean? Do what do you, uh, architecture, you know, I was like, sure. What majors do you yeah, have? Exactly. It was Can like, you take me to the right. Olympics? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, uh, cause that was it. That was my goal. That was a dream that I'd set in front of me and I wasn't going to stop till I got there. And so anyway, so that coach came in town. And I worked harder than I think I've ever worked before just to catch his eye while he was coaching. And, uh, and then we had a, uh, a lunch meeting, um, that I requested, not that he was like, Oh, I want to meet with that guy. But I requested, Hey, do you think you could, we could have like a little lunch meeting. And so we talked and he's like, you know what? Yes, Spencer, I will take a chance on you. That's my Russian accent, by the way. That's the best I got. I love it. Yeah. He, uh, so he took a chance on me, and um, so I went there uh, right after high school, and um, just had it was just amazing. Had an amazing time, an amazing experience. And um, was it a, a college or was it in Russia? Like, was it a Russian training? Nope. Good area? question. It was uh, in Colorado Springs. Okay. Uh, they have the U.S. Olympic Training Center in there in Colorado Springs, and um, so it was. It it was yeah. It's an amazing. It's an amazing facility, and. Um, and really, I ended up, uh, I was there for a few years, and then there was a, a, a gymnast I had, um, you know, grown to be friends with, was was really, really good. He had been, he was going on to his second Olympics, and anyways, he was starting a team, his, his coach was starting an elite team in Texas, and uh, I'd kind of butted heads with my my coaches there, and um, and I just, you know, I just loved the fact that this uh, coach was, you know, was, he was just an American coach. He was born and raised here. And I thought that was, that was, I don't know, special to me that, you know, kind of like these colors don't run, you know, you've, you've, you've lived it from the beginning. And so I ended up, uh, leaving and going to this, this gym in Texas, uh, for the last few years of my career where I ended up retiring, but, um, and it was, and it was, it was phenomenal. Sure. So, so you're in Colorado Springs, um, you're trained for that. For for those of us, including myself, that yeah. don't know the process, it's every four years is your mm-hmm. yeah. is your Olympic uh, cycle. What does that look like? Is there like a hundred athletes training for a team of ten? Like what's the what's the number ratio? And where are you? Yeah, were you trying to or almost to that point where you could try to get on the team to at least go to the Olympics? Absolutely. So part of it is exposure. You know, you got to compete. There's several competitions throughout the country that you do, and some international ones, but really primarily the ones within the country that they're, you're, they're tracking your progress, right? I mean, you're being watched. Uh, how are you recovering? Are you injured? Um, you're, you're, you know, there's six events, Olympic events, and they're looking at, all right, they're putting the best team together. And at that point there was five, they take five guys and they're looking at, are you going to contribute? What are your best events? And of those best events, are you going to compliment these other guys, you know, on these, on their best events so that you can collectively have the best team score? Uh, because they'll take the top, basically they take all of your event scores and they add them up 
you know, to make your, your best. Yep. Like, like a track meet basically. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, uh, so there's a lot of, I mean, there's politics in it just like anything else. So you got to go to the right beats. You got to show up at the right time. Uh, there's time to rest your body and there's time to make sure you're showing, showcasing really. Um, so, so then as we got closer to it, um, I was just the one first, when I started, I was very much the one that qualified into these big events, the last spot. You know what I mean? That's really why I got pretty well known in the communities because I was the last one to get in of every big meet. And then it'd be like, all right, you can qualify the second day of this meet, but you got to be in this spot. So I had to move up, but I was still the last one. And people kind of got to know me from that. Um, and so I started, I was, re I just was, I was going up and up and up and just getting more successful and more successful. And I, I got into maybe around the top 15 guys and then it started to come it started to plateau and then it started to go back down. And that was, it was like, it became real to the point where people around me started thinking he's going to do it. Like he's going to actually do it. And it was, it was, and it, it was so, I felt like it was so close. This is going to sound wild, but I could almost, I could almost taste it. I could taste the, the air and the environment. I could see myself walking, opening ceremonies that, and, and the crowd around us chanting USA as we walked down, you know what I mean? It was like, I saw it so vividly that I was going to be there that when it started to go away and I knew my body was not recovering as quick as it needed to be, um, I, I had to step away. And that was, I, I had a very, very big identity crisis that year. Um, just trying to figure out, cause that became my identity. That was how people knew me was the gymnast that kind of in, in some regards changed his stars. You know, I was never... I was never the the best, you know, in Iowa, it was really easy to, be, to, to rise up and be the best because we have never had a lot of gymnasts here, you know, and then regionally too, nationally, you know, I, I'd start getting well known as a, as a junior athlete, meaning 18 and younger. But then when you step in with the big boys, it's a whole new, it's a whole new game. Sure. Well, as you're going through that kind of like, I mean, you made this decision at like what, 16, 17, when you decided I'm moving away from home, 14, or yeah. four, 14 years mm -hmm. old. Um, yeah. What was that like when you're talking with your parents and trying to figure out, you know, is this right for Spencer to go? Because yeah. I know my mom, if I had asked her when I was 14, hey, yeah. can I move away and go specialize in a sport? She'd be like, hell no, get off <laughs> your the crack pipe, you psycho. <laughs> like, go to bed. You're, yeah. you're losing your mind. Yeah. What, what, was, what was the conversations like? Because that takes a lot of one, like you, you've chosen your path already. Like, this is what I'm doing. And yeah. then also like having buy-in from your family and knowing that that's the right choice for you. How did that conversation go? So it was hard. I mean, um, you know, I was pretty confident that that's what I wanted, but I didn't really fully understand what the sacrifice was going to be at that time. And, uh, you know, I had had, this was the one thing my parents had seen really me come to life doing. And, uh, I think that the joy that they saw me in, in pursuing that and how quickly I had kind of, uh, found success in it was really evident to them. And so, I'm, I'm sure their answer would probably be different than mine. Um, I, that's a, that's a question I've not asked them revisited. Hey, what was it like that, that initial conversation before taking that leap? But, um, but they supported me on that. They've always, you know, my, my mom, especially it's been one to really push us towards pursuing our dreams. And each one of my siblings has something that they're really, really good at, which is super cool. And it's all, we're all so very different, but, um, but yeah, she pushed me to do that. And, uh, you know, it helped starting in Nebraska cause I could come back on weekends, but, um, but it was really, really hard. You know, you move into a host family and they have a whole new set of rules and, um, expectations. And, uh, it definitely, if without a dream and a, a major goal, I don't think it would have been possible. One, well, obviously by choosing this is I'm doing this so I can become the best gymnast I can possibly be. When you get laser focused on that goal, mm -hmm. you got so good. Like yeah. you, everything, I mean, you became literally the best you could be uh, just slightly short of making that Olympic team. Yeah. What, what did that feel like for you? As like you said, you, you gained a lot of confidence as a, as a man building that skill set and that, that self-esteem builder. Yeah. How did that feel for you as you were starting to build that skill set? And you're like, like you said, you're going from six hours a week to 35 hours a week over the course of time. Yeah. How did that build up your confidence to get to that point? 
it was like, I mean, it's like the movies, you know, when they start and all of a sudden you see the guy putting in the training and it's like, da, 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 da. you know, that's how it was. It was like, it felt good. It felt really good. And as I kept getting these benchmarks, you know, I, and they kept going higher and higher, it was like, I'm the man, you know what I mean? It, it feels like, man. And, and, you know, when you're working so hard to achieve something so great and you just keep getting closer to it, there's, there's few things that are feel greater than that. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? No, I, I totally understand that. We're kind of going back to Olympic team, they're doing the, mm-hmm. they're, they're figuring that out. It sounds like you bowed out because you knew in yeah. your heart that you were done. Yep. Walk me through that identity crisis and, and how you navigated that. Cause I'm sure that was a devastating blow for you when yeah, you're yeah. like, I'm, I have to hang it up and I'm choosing to hang it up. Yeah. So, so at the time, um, you know, I'd recently gotten married and, uh, I'd met my wife through this process and, and who was amazing. She was just an amazing, uh, has been an amazing sports system. Was she also a gymnast? She was, okay. uh, yeah, actually. I can imagine that since you're yeah. literally only ever on the mats, that's the yeah. only place you're ever yeah. at. You probably could only meet <laughs> your wife there. Yeah, so. that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, 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 uh, we ended up, uh, moving back from Houston back to Des Moines, Iowa, um, in, uh, to West Des Moines. I took a coaching job and, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, a good salary job. You know, I was fortunate to get several offers when I was done because people had known, you know, what I had done and, you know, what I'd pursued. So, um, so that was pretty great. Uh, they were also looking for an exit strategy. They didn't have, they had kids that weren't interested in their business. So, uh, the plan was to work up into ownership of that, of that specific gym and, um, but I came back and, and that was going to be over a matter of several, several years, you know what I mean? Um, but I came back and I was coaching and I had really come from being in the limelight to being behind the scenes. And I struggled with that because now, you know, I wasn't at these competitions, people asking me for autographs anymore. It was like, I was at meets and people didn't know who I was, you know what I mean? And, and these other gymnasts, you know, that were, that I was coaching, you know, it was very low level at that time. Cause I just started the boys program there. And, um, I just was not feeling rewarded or valued in, and because I had put all my eggs into one basket there for myself, I was like, this is who I am. But I never thought, who am I after this? You know what I mean? I guess I, 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 I thought I saw myself being in the, in the Olympic team, going on tour collecting that money. Cause really you don't really make money. You do make money, but it's, it's, it's pennies on the dollar compared to what you make after the Olympic team. Once you make the Olympic team, there's a whole new set of doors that open for you. You can get on Wheaties boxes, Absolutely. Nike comes that's knocking. Right. Yeah. Uh, you look at Phelps after, Oh yeah. after, I mean, he, I mean, that's a completely different, <laughs> uh, what he's got more hardware than yeah, Ace right. does. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's like, I think that's, it opens you up though. Right. Cause Absolutely. how, how are you living going into that? Did the did the programs provide living accommodations and, and a salary to at least get by or how nope. did you live? So I was working too at that time. Uh, my wife was working. I mean, it's paycheck to paycheck. I mean, you're just, you're just getting by, you're not saving anything. You're just getting by. So, uh, I mean, we were, we were fine, but we weren't, I mean, we're, there's nothing bougie about our life. Nothing. You know what I mean? So, um, so then when we moved back, it was like, I just felt super, I felt super alone, but I was also creating that for, for myself. I was putting myself in that, that bubble. And so I became, you know, like drinking became a huge thing for me. You know what I mean? Like I was just trying to numb myself, um, from the feelings and, and really addressing, Hey, why do I feel like that? And then, and looking in like, Hey, I'm valuable and I've got, uh, aspirations and it's not, I'm not done yet. You know what I mean? I wasn't looking at myself at that point. I was looking at myself like, I'm a failure. You know what I mean? I chase, I sacrificed so much of my life for this crazy dream. And all the people that said you couldn't do it, they're right. You know what I mean? That's what the, the, these are, those are the thoughts that I was telling myself. So I remember, um, you know, I was, I was drinking, I was drinking, driving, I was just making really poor decisions. And I'll never forget. Um, uh, I had been pulled over like three times. Every time the cop had let me, let me off, came over, did, you know, I would do stand on one, one foot and counted 30. And I was like, great. You know, and I was, I was wanting to be brought in. I was wanting, cause I felt like it's the only way to get past this, you know, is to get free of this I felt so stuck in this rut. And, uh, I remember it was like, God came down and held me firm 
because it was like, I stood on one foot and I was like, he's like, camera records from 20. I was like 20, 19, 18, 17. Like, how am I doing this? This is wild. You right. know what I mean? And then after that, so then I was like, whatever, you know, that's fine. And so I then I drove home, blah, blah, blah. Happened another night and I'm driving back in Polk City at the time. And I remember this cop is put on his lights. He's coming to pull me over. I'm like, great. This is it. You know, I'm ready. And he goes, uh, sir, have you been drinking tonight? And I was like, yeah, yes, I have. Well, how much have you been drinking? I was like, I'm not sure. You know, it's, it's been, you know, quite a bit. And, uh, so he's like, all right, give me your license, registration, give it to him. And I'm like, all right, you know, and I'm accepting, this is going to be the new trajectory. This is the, this is the trajectory I needed, needed to take. But also I felt like this is what I deserve. This is what I deserve to go on to this next, this next path for me, wherever it takes me. You're like punishing yourself Absolute, almost. hundred percent. Like I just need to like hurt yeah. myself to exactly. real, like I deserve to be punished because yeah. I didn't make it. Right. Yeah. Which is just so crazy. So crazy. But anyways, the, the cop comes back. I'll never forget this because he goes back. He said, you know, here, here, you're going to hear this again, this, this phrase again. Uh, I probably shouldn't, I probably shouldn't do this, you know, but I'm gonna let you go. And he said, but get home, go home. And I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing? Thinking in my mind, do your job. Just do your job. You have one job officer, just do it. And anyways, he lets me off. I go home that night, drink some more pass out in the shower, right? Over wow. the drain. Uh, I wake up, um, to my wife pulling me out. You know what I mean? I'm choking on water. And that was, that was a defining point for me right there. It's like, I really felt like only my stuff, all this, all the crap that I was doing was just pulling myself down that I was so consumed with, with myself that I wasn't realizing that I was pulling down the people around me. And she was just like, looking at me like, what, what, what is going on with you? Like, and at that time, what she was saying is, am I not enough for you? Am I not your Olympics? You know what I mean? Am I not good enough? And I was, it was such an awakening that I was like, wow, this is crazy. So I, I, I told my dad, I told, uh, you know, my brother, my brother-in-law and at, at the time and a couple other guys, I said, I just need some accountability. I'm just not, I'm not doing well. And that was the first time I'd said that maybe ever to confess that to other guys, Hey, I'm not doing well. You know, I I'm not okay. And then, then I took like a two year hiatus of just water and coffee. You know, that was it water sure. and coffee. And, um, and I began to, to heal, you know what I mean? And I was like, you know what, I'm going to really, I'm going to really pursue this coaching thing. Like I'm really going to pursue this. And what I found out, what, what happened when I stopped worrying about me and I started actually pursuing coaching is that everything I did, this is wild in gymnastics, coaching turned to gold. It was like, I'm going to start the boys program and I'm going to really, I'm really going to pursue it. All of a sudden I had like six guys leave a gym and move to my gym for a competitive team. And the owners were like, it's going to be years before you have a competitive team. It was year one. It was like that year started a competitive team. They're like, well, it's going to be years before you make it to, you know, regionals, whatever. It was year two, we made it to regionals. So well, they said, well, it's going to be years before you make it to nationals. Cause they've been pursuing this for, for, you know, decades on the women's side and had it taken them forever to be successful. And I'm like, this is, I don't know what's going on here. And then year three, we were at nationals. We were making it to nationals. And then the next year, one of those boys signed for a scholarship at a D one college. I, it was crazy. And I you started up, the program from four years from scratch, nothing to nothing. You've got a athlete placed that's competing at the national or the collegiate level. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. Made it to the collegiate level. It was, it was, it was just wild. It was literally like, I just took off. And what I found is that all that training, all that experience that had gone up, that stuff with my, my parents and my dad, my struggles with the sport and stuff. Uh, it was just educating me. It was like my, it was like my, my college education to prepare me for what I'm really gifted at, which is coaching. And so once I fully was like, I'm okay with being behind the scenes, then it was like, things just took off and I loved it. I found that I'm much more talented as a, as a uh, coach than I w ever was an athlete. And I enjoyed it more. And I was like, I was missing this for, for that first, you know, eight months. I was really missing what my purpose was. You know what I mean? And so then when things just started taking off, it was, it was super, super rewarding. So I, so that this has been, you know, about five years now at this time, right. I'm really successful. I'm like, okay, 
Um, and at this point we're supposed to start transitioning into, uh, ownership. What's this going to look like? So I'm talking with the owners and they're kind of resilient. Things were just really getting weird around the gym. My wife was working there too. They had a preschool, uh, involved with it. And, um, things just, yeah, something was off. Something was not right. And, um, I'm thinking we're preparing for ownership. And so, uh, and people are talking to me there that the owners are asking stuff about me while, while I'm gone at meets. And so I'm like, something is just not right. So they bring me in. And like I told you in my contract, I had, they were looking, they had an, we're looking for an exit strategy. So I had first rights to buy. And, um, so they bring me in and, and essentially what happened is they're, they're ready to step out somebody that's owned a gym, been really successful, owned a couple gyms, came in and was like, Hey, I'd like to purchase this, this gym from you guys, but they couldn't, um, you know, and they had two options at the time and I, I don't blame them. They have somebody that's, that's done it for a while and they have somebody that's never had any experience doing it at all. Right. Right. It's not apples to apples. I mean, I, I completely get it, but, um, the only way for me to, for them to do that, pursue that is if I quit or if I'm fired. Right. So, um, and as you probably learned now, by now I'm pretty resilient. So, and thick headed. So I was like, I'm not going to quit. You know what I mean? So then, and my wife and I had just had, um, we had had, we had a two year old or a three year old and a one year old at the time. And, uh, and so they fired, fired, fired us both, you know what I mean? So that they could uh, do that. And, you know, this is something that they had built. It's essentially another child that they, they had built from scratch, you know, a name, um, and everything. So that's, that's a big deal. You know what I mean? But at the time, that's not what it felt like. You know what I mean? So we were jobless, right? And I had b taken that job so that I could, uh, so that I could own the gym and start sculpting other, other people and, and really pouring, giving back to this community that give me so much. Yeah. Right. And, uh, what I found is that I was jobless, both of us on, um, filing for, you know, unemployment and then thinking, what, what am I going to do now? Now I can take a job coaching, but then that's it. It doesn't go anywhere or I can pursue owning, opening something, um, and, and following my dream, my newfound dream. And so once again, that's what I did. We've, you're you're at the rock new rock bottom new rock bottom and you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps yep. and said what next common theme common theme in the Johnson household and uh, so that was hard I mean um, that led me to you know I I, I talked to several gym owners successful um, uh, gym owners flew me to their gyms and they would say they would say all right here's the up uh, here's the the good things here's the bad things here's what you should do. Um, but, and, and I talked to gym owners that tried and failed and there was, there was no common theme really with any one of these gyms. They would say, Hey, don't do this. Some would say, Hey, do this. It's really profitable. Some would say, don't do it. It's not profitable. So it was really difficult. So they said, you've got to do what you feel like is going to be uh, successful. And I was like, okay. So that's what I did. I put together a business plan, um, and took some time. Uh, I picked up, uh, there's a great, mom and pop cheer gym that, that paid me on the side and I helped them out. Just wonderful people, wonderful family. Just coaching to make some extra money, extra money, yep. you know, um, so that I could put all my eggs into this new basket. Right. And, uh, once again, my wife was all, she was in it. She trusted it. You know, it was obviously a, this was a huge blow for our family. You know, like we were struggling with that. And, um, so I'm trying, I'm not trying to get this, get this loan for this new gym. And I have boys at this, at this, uh, other gym, you know, that are waiting for me to do this so that they can come over because they're basically coachless at the time. And, uh, so I am just really pursuing it. And so I, I go to banks and they're like, listen, I can't, we cannot give you this loan, you know? And, and as you know, now my dad couldn't help me with this loan because of his, his, you know, federal offense, he's not able to get a loan. Um, and he totally would have, but, um, uh, so they're like, if the problem is if we take everything you own, everything, it's not even close to cover what it's going to be. If you go under, sure. And they're like, I don't know. We don't have to say yeah. this dude, but you're yeah. not, they you're like, not a good person to invest in. <laughs> I remember him saying, he's like, this, this is a great business plan. I like you. This is, I, I want it to work. Like he was really meeting me at such a, such a sensitive way that he could have just said, I'm sorry. But he was like, 
you don't, you, you not even close. You need a, you need a personal guarantor that is going to be able to sign off that has this substantial value that, um, you know, has this, this, these mo- this money that could cover it. So then I start calling people. I'm just calling calls. I mean, probably for a month and a half, I'm just on the phone multiple times a day. Hey, here's my business plan. I want to bring kids together and, and adults alike. I want to have a place where the family can grow and physically be fit. You know what I mean? That they can come and experience this together and not just have it be an individualized thing like it was for me, but to have it full encompassing where families can go and they can grow and they can get healthy and, and just make it a way of life. You know what I mean? And so I'd be on a roll and I'd have people that are like, Hey, listen, I, I, I got to stop you right there. I love your passion, but we're, I'm out. Like, this is not, this is not for me. You know what I mean? And so it was really depressing, uh, after a while. And I almost was like, all right, this is just not meant for me. You know what I mean? It, this is God saying, Hey, sorry, buddy. It's time to, time to face the facts. You know what I mean? And, uh, and then somebody I'd called a lawyer called me back. He said, Hey, listen, I know a guy and he reminds me exactly like you. He, I mean, you guys talk similar. You're, you, you just got to talk to him. You know, here's his number. Give him a call. I call this guy. I talk to him. I'm giving him the, the, the breakdown and I'm passionate about it. I'm like, I, I, I know I can make this work. I know I can do it. I really believe in it. And uh, he goes, Spencer, Spencer, I'm going to stop you right there. I was like, great. Just lost another one. And he said, I love it. I love it. Why don't you bring your wife up? Um, and come to, I've got a couple of businesses, um, and I want you to come and, and check them out and we'll talk. So we go do that. And he's got, um, obviously they, uh, or he said, all right, how can I be a part of this? What do you need from me? And, um, what is it going to look like? And I was like, here's where I'm going to lose him. I said, listen, I, I can't thank you enough for this meeting, but I know I have a vision and a dream of what I want. And I'm, I'm afraid to add somebody into that. So I really, it's important that I'm the sole owner of this gym so that I can pursue this vision and this dream. And, um, because I'm worried about the, uh, what a partnership would do. And I had looked in and spoken with several businesses that have had partnerships that just did not go well. And I didn't want somebody that was good at making money that knew nothing about the industry to come in and have a say in it. And he said, and so I was, I was ready to wrap it up. And so I, in fact, I went to shake his hand. He said, you know what? I had somebody, uh, believe in me when I started and I've been waiting to pay it forward. So he said, I- I'm happy to do that for you guys. And I was like, what? <laughs> you That's know, like, crazy. Insane. So he comes down to the bank, writes his name on this paper saying, if he goes under this guy, I just met said, if he goes under, I'll cover the cost of That's that. That's wild. Wild. So at this point you have to think there's someone looking out for you somewhere, right? Like who, who did I like say oh, from man. a burning building? That's like actually got like a, like a little fairy on your shoulder. That's wild though. Like how, how close were you to being like, this is over before you had that meeting with him? Cause it seems like you were like, okay, I've li- exhausted all the effort I could possibly do to try to find financing or a yeah. partnership or some like, some co-signer for this loan, yeah. some way to do this. Like where, how close are you to giving up at that point? I mean, man, I, I, it, it felt close, you know, it felt close. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how far I would have pursued it, but I know for my family's sake, I could, I was running out of, I was running out of time. You know what I mean? It was, it was, uh, you know, you can only have unemployment for so long. And then as soon as that was done, we had no savings. I mean, we had probably a thousand dollars to our name. And, uh, cause we had been sacrificing that for the, this business that we thought we were going to own and run. Right. So I was invested in that. And, uh, so yeah, we, I was close to having, it wouldn't have been a choice of mine. It would have been a choice of our family. What, what's the right thing to do at that point? And I was, we, I was right at the tail end of that. So yeah, I mean, it, that phone call came at, you know, just the right minute. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. So you, you get the, the mm-hmm. sign off from the bank. You have mm-hmm. this personal guarantor that comes in and kind of gets you over the finish line. Yeah. How long ago was this and, and what steps did it take to get to the point where you guys built out your current business? So this was about, uh, let's see, June 1st will be our six year anniversary. Um, and so we signed, uh, 
just about six months before that, um, for everything. And, uh, and yeah, so it was, I would say, so the first, the first year, you know, we're still living on the loan, you know what I mean? So like, um, you know, and we're building it and it's like, I mean, this is a, I thought training was hard. This was a new level of hard, you know, um, I've never, I've never shied away from hard work, but this was, this was hard work that I've never experienced before. It was, uh, you know, 12, 13 hour days every day for, you know, for six months building it out. Cause I did a lot of the build out in, in the building to save money on labor costs and stuff like that. Um, so you're, you're hanging drywall, you're painting absolutely. walls, you're, you're, you're yep. buffing the floors, all that stuff. hundred percent. Yep. Yep. Building obstacles. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was grueling. I mean, it was absolutely grueling. I'd had, I had a guy that came in, uh, paid him a small salary, young guy who, uh, uh, named Nate and he was just awesome. He came in there and he grinded with me until we opened. And then shortly after he was like, he was like Hey, I got to move on. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> My I get it, dude. I'm, I'm get tired, it. boss. <laughs> it's like, it's the line from the green mile. Yeah, I'm tired, yeah, boss. Yeah. <laughs> He, I, I was, I didn't blame him either. Cause basically it was a small salary anyways, but the amount of hours we were putting in, he's probably making five or $4 an hour. I mean, it was like, it was just, it was just crazy. And I couldn't have done it without him. And I'd had other family members, uh, and it helped, you know, to, you know, which I was so thankful for, but, um, but man, it, it was unbelievable. And then the day we're building until the, our opening day we're still getting mats down things in place. And then they, and then kids come in and it was just like, cause you didn't really have time to think about it. Cause we're trying to get this deadline. You know, you want to open as soon as you're, they start charging you. And, uh, and it was just a really surreal, surreal day as kids started pouring, pouring in for this free day for them to come in. And it's like, wow, you're like, who am I? I'm just this lowly Iowan hyperactive dyslexic kid who didn't do great in school, has no education, no college education and pursued a crazy dream that just a small percentage of people ever get to attain and didn't make it. And now here I am. And I just opened a a business and backwards, might I add, everybody said, start small, start small, start small. And I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to start big. And, uh, which is what I did. So then when they came in, it was like, it was almost like time stopped and, and started in slow motion as they're coming in. You're just like, wow, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. But that small glimpse of hope and excitement soon dwindled out. Okay. Sure. Like, <laughs> You're like yeah. a little spark of like, yeah, all these 15 hour days yep. were worth it. Um, so as you're going through that, at that point, did you, did you realize, um, obviously you'd bitten off a lot that you're like, okay, we have to do this, but also your new identity had kind mm -hmm. of had that, had that hit yeah. you yet of like, I am now a coach and a business owner and I, I can, and I'm proud to say that I'm not like, well, I, you know, you look at the glory days, like, let me show you my trophy case. Like it, it, did that hit you yet where you're like, you identified as I'm a business owner, I'm a coach, like, and I'm happy about it. And I'm, I, that, that's who I am. I think I'd really, uh, identified as a coach. I'd really, um, I'd really, you know, I'd loved that and it, it had become part of me and I was really, and I was excited about that. I was excited about that title. Um, and the owner ownership part of it didn't really hit me right away. In fact, it wasn't until it was probably, it was probably a year or two in that I remember I was standing, we have a mezzanine down the middle of the gym so you can look down at all sides of, of the gym. And I remember down there and I think we had, it, it was just a night where we had classes and I was just like, and th it was full of classes. And I was like, why are these kids here? You know, like, what, what, why are they here? Like, it's like, you know, I, I meet the coaches that I bring in, you know, we, I train them and then they're coaching these classes and it's like, they're here because you gave them this opportunity and you believed in it. And then all of a sudden it was like, they're showing up. And I'm, that's, I remember that day. I'll never forget that day. And somebody had said like, Spencer, look around, look at this place. You know, it's, it's packed. You know what I mean? And it wasn't really packed at that time, but relatively speaking for the gym being that, that new, it felt packed. And it was just, it was like, I'm like, I'm a gym owner. 
Like I'm, I'm actually doing this. So that was, that was kind of that defining day for me. And slowly, I, I think I, over the course of probably five to maybe even six years to now, I've really fully felt most comfortable in the clothes that I'm in. Yep. You know what I mean? That Absolutely. makes sense. No, that makes total sense. As you guys, you said, yeah, that s- slow glimmer of uh, excitement opening day <laughs> where there's millions of people yeah. showing up for a free workout. Yeah. Um, what what happened after that that made that kind of dwindle a little bit too quick? Well, so, you know, we had a global pandemic, obviously, which was terrifying. Because when, when did you open? Was it in 2020 or just before? We opened in 2018. Okay. So, um, so it was, you know, we had had uh, been struggling. Well, we actually... It crazy part is we that right before 2020 we were really, really struggling to make ends meet, and uh, in fact I had to go out and essentially beg people for money. Um, the bank wasn't going to give me any more, um, and then uh, the I got out. I basically had I I couldn't get out any more credit card debt. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't. Um, or get any more credit card, uh, get a line of credit. You know, they, I, they I just capped you. At, I'd, I'd been capped everywhere. Yep, you yep. know what I mean? And, uh, so then I essentially just went around begging for money because we weren't going to make it. We weren't going to be making it. And so, um, that went on for about six months and then, uh, and then the global pandemic happened right into that. So then we were like, what's going to happen? What are we going to do now? And the remarkable thing was then, you know, the government funding, you know, the governor helped a lot. You know, we were able to make, uh, we're to defer our loan payments um, and same for our, our, our lease payments as well. The, our landlord was great. Uh, he was like, you know what, I'm just going to take these. I'm going to put them on the backside if you're all right with that. And we're just going to, we're just going to make it. Don't worry about anything right now. And you're like, we are okay with I'm that. Like, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> so that part ended up being great. And then the the PPP, you know, the Paycheck Protection Plan. So that was great. And uh, it really, it was such a, it was such a horrible thing to have happen, but it was actually wonderful for our family. And I know that sounds like a terrible thing to say. It sounds like it saved the business, really. It really did. It saved the business. And on top of that, I was able to, we had some family time. Like I had been so pulled away from the family, you know what I mean? And my wife's trying to juggle the kids and also helping with the business. And so she's, she's burning the candle both ends, just like I am in a different manner. You know what I mean? So we both were just exhausted and, and there was no way, there was no foreseeable future out of it at that point in time, you know, because this was our first venture doing this. And, uh, so we were able to, to step back, breathe, you know what I mean? Have some family time and remember that. And, and for me to remember, this is why I'm doing it. Really. The ultimate reason is for my wife and for my kids. That's, that's, that was my number one thing. She's my priority. And then the kids, you know what I mean? And so I was able to refocus. And so then when we opened up, I felt a new sense of, um, just calm and I guess also drive. So then we started really going at it. And, uh, as people came back and, you know, that was a hard time too, because what's the right thing to do? You know, we were getting emails, Hey, uh, you know, so-and-so is not masked. I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, uh, they're like, they they have a medical condition. They, they literally can't do it because that they, they could die. You know what I mean? Well, we could die from whatever they have without wearing a mask. I'm like, okay, uh, you do you and you do you. And then it was like, oh, my, I, my coach or my son has never seen my coach's face ever. And I'm like, well, you know, we're trying to, it's, it's state law. You know, we're just trying. So it's like, there's no winning here. It's just yeah. wild. So that part was really, really stressful too. Cause he felt like somebody's upset about something. And it's not something like, Hey, I don't agree with your class structure or like, Hey, I feel like I should get a refund. Those are eat cakewalks compared to this stuff. It was like, Hey, you're putting my kid at risk. I'm like, well, no, we're not. You're bringing them to us and we're doing the best that we can with the knowledge that we've been given. Yeah. Uh, so it was just, that part was wild. So as things got back to normal, people really started to come in and I felt, I felt like I was getting in a better groove of, of, you know, training staff, um, and 
being present and also balancing work and home life. Cause that is something that nobody talks about. When I was going around to all these gyms, nobody said the hardest thing is going to be to balance, uh, being a owner and being dad and a husband. And so it really is, was something that I had to, it was trial and error. And, you know, I've been blessed with a, a wonderful wife who's been, been great, you know, understanding she's always known I've been this crazy dreamer obviously since I was young, she was willing to go on the journey with me. And, um, but, uh, but you know, so with that, there came times where I was just not around because I had, I was like, well, something broke at the gym. We can't afford to have somebody there or somebody just decided they're not working with us anymore. Just didn't show up. You know, sometimes that happens. We hire kids, you know what I mean? Stuff mm -hmm. happens. So it's like, well, I got to pick up these shifts. So I'm just coaching all the time. So, after the pandemic and stuff started cooling down and everybody got back to normal, when we came back, it was, I had found, I needed for, for myself to be able to have that time with my family. And so like Sundays, we're not open anymore. I said, we're not going to do it. You know what I mean? People were like, it could be really profitable. I'm like, yeah, but what, there, what is actually valuable? You know what I mean? Is it, is it money? Cause I thought that was going to bring us, you know, peace and, you know, happiness. And, uh, but it, what it wasn't, it was, it was pulling us apart. You know what I mean? So, uh, close that off. And I was like, I'm not working weekends anymore. And, uh, and I found a really healthy balance and it helped me. What I found is not only was it obviously better for my kids and better for my wife, but it was better for me. And I found that I was giving more, I was able to contribute more in the gym. My, my mental capacity was, was, was just stronger. And uh, I feel like I could retain more because I wasn't thinking about all the things I, I wished I was doing or why we were arguing about something like that. Or, you know what I mean? I felt like I was more present. And then because of that, it also made me a better coach as well. So, um, so just, it's been wild. Yeah. It's been absolutely wild. It sounds interesting too. Cause I mean, and that's the thing that most people don't talk about is like, you can always go get more money. If you yeah. botch things with your family, that's really hard to undo that, you yeah. know, and like, you, I mean, just especially when you got young kids or kids that are kind of growing up and it's like you miss enough uh, sporting events or you don't come home for dinner so yeah. many nights in a row. It's like people just start thinking the kids start thinking you don't want to be there. And it's like, yep. no, it's not. I don't it's not that I don't like you. It's that I'm getting yeah. pulled to this other thing. So having that presence of mind to retract back is super, super powerful as you guys are kind of like coming up on, you know, he said 2019 or so you're out, like out with a chicken costume with an arrow, like come, <laughs> come in here, come in here. And you know, you're like running low. Um, how, like, do you remember how many like members you had? And it was like, we need this number of members and we only have this number of members compared to like where you're at today. So we can understand like what you guys were on the brink of like closing yeah. compared to where you're at now. So that's a great question. And funny, I, it, my answer to that, I've always wondered, you know, people, you know, and people have asked me that before and, and maybe this is crazy or moronic. Um, but I, I really just did not ever look at our, our numbers. I just looked at our bottom line and it's like, are we, are we meeting it? No, we're not. Okay. We need more. We need to do better. We can't raise prices. You know what I mean? What can we do to create more revenue? And so I really, I mean, it's, it sounds crazy, but I didn't really have time to stop and crunch numbers. I just knew we weren't, we weren't there. Sure. You know what I mean? So I just kept, and I knew that the more I put in into it, the more exciting I could be, the better the environment, because really the art, there's a lot of great gyms out there. There really are. I mean, in, in the Metro there's, there's, and I, I I'd point people to them. And sometimes I do, I said, Hey, this isn't the right place. Check these places out. They're great. They really are. But what I think is what we offer that's so different is an, an environment. You know what I mean? Our atmosphere is, is very different. And that's because I work really hard to make sure that everybody feels that, that when everybody's here, that they're noticed, they're respected and they're honored for their hard work. I, you know, I work really hard. My staff, I, they, they know that I know them by name. I, you know, when I come in and sometimes I know there's times where they don't want this, but it, which makes me do it. Cause it's so funny, but I'll announce them. You know what I mean? Like I say their name and I'm just like, woo, you know, and a lot of times they're like, yeah, you know, like they love it. You know, I, I'm sure there's days just like for me, there's days where I'm like, oh man, I hope, Spen I hope Spencer does not see me coming in right now. Cause I'm just so tired, but, but I think there's a takeaway there. You know what I mean? So anyways, to get back to your question, I think, uh, I think, uh, for me, it was like, I just got to keep going, just keep going, 
just keep going, just keep going. And I did believe that we could get there. I really did. Um, because I, I knew I, I, I believed that there was not another owner that was outworking me. That was working harder than me to do it. And I know, I know it was working and I saw the trends that we had. So I, I, I knew we could get there. Um, I just had to survive, you know what I mean? Sure. To get there and, um, surviving that plus, you know, my family was really, really hard. That was easily probably the hardest. I would say that was probably the hardest year of my life because, uh, because it was the first time, you know, my wife was like, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. Like this is it's. And so we were just, we were struggling and there was no foreseeable, like I said, alley out of it. There was no like, Oh, here's the off ramp. You know what I mean? Right. We're stuck now in it. We foreclose is the only option yep. or we keep going. You know what I mean? So that was hard. F- that was the hard pill to swallow was that it was like, we just have to keep going. And she's, and my wife's saying like, I get it. I just don't know if I can. Sure. You know well, I mean? it's, it's you're, you're in new waters. Like you said, like this dream and it in, in your mind, it's sunshine and rainbows. And then yeah. it's like, Oh shit. Like yeah, we have exactly. to actually like, that's, that's perfect. It's yeah. just hard to do that. Cause I know, especially like, I know I'm, I have a different experience than a lot of people. Cause I have my education in business mm-hmm. and a, like for someone like yourself that didn't have any college and you're just like zero, I just know gymnastics. I know how the, how the actual thing being provided in there. How did you kind of like learn on the fly with some of the, the business stuff to get to the point where you're like, like you said, learning about mass mandates mm-hmm. and staffing and hiring and like the, the limited financial stuff that you want to look at. Cause it's like, Oh crap, yeah. like I got to do this stuff, but I really don't want to, you know, that type of stuff. So I really, I understood quickly that I was not going to be the one to be able to carry certain aspects of the gym. And so I delegated. So I took, uh, I, I, I paid for, uh, certain people to do certain jobs. Like, like I knew I was going to be the most profitable in the gym, working hands-on, uh, communicating, uh, creating the environment. But to do that, I needed to be able to be present. Right. So, you know, I delegated like our QuickBooks to somebody that I really trusted. You know what I mean? I delegated, uh, our front desk, to people that I trusted, you know what I mean? I delegated, um, you know, just, just certain jobs, uh, a lot of them administrative, just sure. the stuff that, cause it would take me like two hours for somebody that's good at it. It's going to take them an hour or 40 minutes. You know what I mean? Like I took me, it would take me a lot longer to get that stuff done. Well, and being dyslexic, that's oh, also man. you're, you're shooting yourself in both. Feet. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> just exactly. hire someone else yeah. to do it. Yeah. But, you know, so, and that, and that's another thing too, is it's like, you know, uh, owners all always say, you know, you're going to do everything by yourself, but I, I really, there was, there just didn't seem possible for me. And could I have learned it and done it? Yeah, I think I could have, but I don't think I would have been optimizing on our truest potential. So we, we spent more to gain quicker, if that makes sense. Sure. So, sure. um, but yeah, but I mean, still it's trial at the end of the day, they're saying, Hey, here's where we're at. Um, or we made this call, I mean, on a client or, or we didn't save a card or we, you know, we charged when we shouldn't have, or we, we don't have a, we don't have a policy in place for this. So, uh, you know, there it's, it's trial and error. There's things that we learned. Okay. Give it to them. Uh, you know what I mean? At, at the end of the day, it was like, if we didn't have something in writing or if we didn't, uh, spell things out, we wanted to be co- uh, complete transparency so that people understood what they get, um, from the day that they walk in. And, uh, so there's no, you know, um, controversy. Sure. You know what I mean? Now there was lots of controversy, but, uh, you know, I learned from the, those things and, you know, there's no perfect way to do it, but yeah, I mean, a lot of those business things that I'm sure you learned and a lot of others, I literally would learn by mistakes. Sure. And I was but like, sometimes that's the best way to learn is just do it. But story yeah, of my life, jump, man. jumping off the deep yeah. end, man. Yeah. I love it. Um, especially as you're kind of figuring that stuff out, um, what about this investor that, or the, the guy that backed you, like, did he ever come, did you ever like tell him about the, the depths of despair you're coming in on 2019? Or was it one so, of those, like, don't, don't, don't call him, don't call him. Like, we can't let him know that it's like, it's getting bad in here, you know? Yeah. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, uh, cause this gets, is about to get really crazy. So, uh, I, first of all, no, I did not ever call him because, uh, first of all, I didn't want him to know. 
Um, and second, I didn't, he'd already taken such a leap of faith in me that I felt like it wasn't right to pursue anything else from him. Uh, I'd had little, he would check in with me every once in a while. I should have been better at saying, it, be like, Hey, you know, just thank you. You know, you're great. But I was so in so deep and he was so great about it. Uh, but here's the wild part. Listen, to this. this just gets, this gets wild. So he calls me a few years in, um, uh, or I think, no, this had to be, I think this was just before. Oh, this was, this was after year one. Okay. okay. This 20, 2019 ish yep. around yep. the right before COVID yep. takes over the whole world. Yep. And I think we were, uh, and so this was about that same time, I guess now thinking about it, thinking back to it, he calls me and says, Hey, I got to tell you something. And I'm like, okay. He's like, uh, you may want to sit down or just have some, you know, so just have some time away from other people. Is this a good time? I said, yeah, what's going on? He said, well, um, I've kind of got some, some money twisted up and, uh, it looks like I'm going to be going away for a little bit. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, for money embezzlement. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yep. Yep. And I was like, Dude, I, you're like, I've heard this story before. Yes. Is this my dad? It's crazy. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, so I'm really, I, I don't know who to talk to. I'm, I'm really struggling. I was like, Oh, uh, uh, I'm sure I was like, uh, 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 mm. and I was like, you know, I've got the perfect guy for you to talk to. And so, uh, I called my dad and I was like, dad, you're not gonna believe this. This is wild. And so I told him and he's like, Oh man. Okay. Yeah. Let's, I need to meet with him. And so, uh, my dad and my mom meet with him and his wife. And, uh, you know, obviously it's not good. She's devastated. He's like still like not really fully grasping the magnitude of it. And, um, so he goes, gets, uh, prison has to go to prison and, um, wild. And it, it, here's the crazy, another crazy part is, uh, the landlord came to me. He's like, Hey, listen, uh, because that got put into our contract, the bank, the loan, we'd already received it. So there's nothing to do about it, but it was put into our, our lease agreement too. And so he kind of said, Hey, you know, I got contacted that your, uh, you know, your personal guarantor is not, um, not, be there. able to guarantee right. anything exactly. anymore because yeah. he's in jail. Right. Yeah. So he goes, um, I'm obligated to tell you that and let's just work on finding another one. And I was like, okay. And has been just phenomenal. And that never happened, but we kept, as we kept growing, he saw, I think he knew that, you know, obviously with what he does, he could see that we were doing really well. Mm -hmm. And at some point you don't need one obviously anymore, but, uh, because legally he could have said, if you don't have one, I'm going to push you out. You know what I mean? Sure. In, in our contract contractually, he could have said you're out. And so I for, will forever be thankful for that. Sure. But the story gets better. So during that time, you know, my dad had started this nonprofit, which is, you know, change courses for people that are coming out of prison. Cause a lot of people would get out and would not have opportunities to be able to get back into the job field or would not not raised, we're we're born into not having opportunity. Well, and you think too, if you're looking at your job pool and you got a hundred applicants and one was an an ex con, it's like, you're like immediately in the trash. Like, and and that's so terrible to think, but it's like, but it's true. Everyone has that stigma, which is very hard to do. So I understand why there's a need for that, uh, to be a setup situation. So, um, he's in contact with, with this the personal guarantor, he gets out, he gets out of prison and my, my dad sets up a, um, a restoration group with him, uh, to get back on his feet. And then, and so he got out and he's been thriving. I've been in touch with him lately, uh, just ran into him. And it's just, it's, it's remarkable how full circle it was who my dad would have never met him had that not happened. And now they're good friends they're really good friends that and talk all the time. And, uh, it's, it's just wild. So, and I would have been able to have this business without, I wouldn't be able to get to where I'm at without my dad. And then I wouldn't have had this business without this other guy. And then this other guy wouldn't be where he's at without you. Yeah. It's just wild. Dude. It's, it's talking about divine <laughs> intervention. Like it's all the puzzle pieces. Cause like you said, this guy felt inclined to, to pass that favor forward. Yeah. 
And now because of your connection with him, he has a life after jail. Like that's, yeah. and it, it, he may have not had those opportunities had he not met you. Right. Like insane, insane how this works. Like insane. Th- the puzzle pieces are all working together. Okay. So we're to that point. At what point do you do American Ninja Warrior? We haven't even talked about oh, this yeah. yet, dude. Your yeah. life story, it, it should be a movie. Uh, <laughs> if I ever decide to get... Um, get into film and do like an actual motion picture. We'll have to contact you about your life story. <laughs> Thank you. Rudy, oh, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Um, so really it had come, uh, my wife and I had just gotten fired. And then, uh, in that time, right before that, a guy came up to me, actually one of the dads, um, his daughter was a gymnast and he was like, Hey, I was just wondering if you could teach me a backflip. And I was just like, Oh, um, that ship has sailed, man. You're like party trick. Yeah. I'm like, I, I don't know. He's like, no, no, no. Listen, I've been on the show called American Ninja Warrior and, uh, it's, you know, uh, I've just, it's part of my audition video. So I just want to learn a backflip and I'm like, okay, well, you know, we can try it. And, um, so anyways, we work, uh, just like, you know, 10 minutes after practice, you know, probably, uh, a few times a week for a couple months. And then he gets a backflip. He's like, yeah, you know, I was thinking about it. You should really send a video in to, you know, audition for the show. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't even know what it is. He's like, it's great. You would love it. It's perfect for you. And he's like, were they, was this season one or was this like, it'd been out for a while. So you could at least look it up. This was season, excuse me, season, uh, uh, six. Okay. Season six at the time. So there was like, you could look at it. It's not like season one where there's no proof of concept. Yeah. It's like, Oh, just a bunch of people jumping off of obstacles and stuff. You know? Yep. Nope. This was season six or seven, six, six or seven, uh, at the time. So this was actually, so this was a couple of years before I had been fired actually the first time. So I send in this video, they call me back. I'm driving. Hey, this is the producers. We want you to be on the show. I'm like, what? Amazing. Awesome. So then uh, I'm like, this is incredible. I've been needing this. I've been needing something. Uh, and so I'm uh, on the warp wall, snap my Achilles. Oh. Yeah. Done. On television? Nope. This was right before the show. This oh is the day God. before the show. And I'm just trying to get figure out the warp wall because I couldn't make it and snap it. I call him. I'm like, hey, I'm actually, I'm not going to make it. I tore my Achilles tendon, severed it. And so they were like, Oh, we're so sorry to hear that. We hope we see you again. So then, you know, full year of recovery. I mean, it was the worst, it was the worst pain I've ever had in my life for sure. And I feel like I've endured a lot of pain, but this one was easily the worst. So take care of your Achilles. <laughs> it's not, it's terrible. But so anyways, so then, uh, so then, uh, two years go by and then that's when we got fired. And I had just sent in an audition before that. So I get fired. They call me and they were like, Hey, um, we want you to be in the show. And I'm just like, that time I'm just like, this is so great. Thank you. I will do that. You know, because I'm like, my life was like not going well. Sure. You're right? like, we just got fired. I was yeah. supposed to own this gym. Oh, yeah. I'll come to California and <laughs> jump off of trampolines for you. Thank you. It's also, the, can you spot me yeah. some money for a plane ticket? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so I, I went, did that and you're not, you're not, well, by now you probably will believe this. I, I run and it's all filmed through the night. Once the sun is down, completely dark, then it starts because it's outside. And then, uh, and then once the sun's up, it's over. So, um, so it's like 77,000, I think applied at that, that year. They take, uh, a hundred, make it in like five different regions, five or six different regions. So, and then from there, the top 40 runners make it to semifinals, which is the next night. Uh, so I ran and I, you go and sit in this w- winter circle, right? And they keep you in there until you get pushed out. You know what I mean? If you're, uh, so I'm in there and I keep getting beat slowly. I'm getting down. Cause I was like fifth of the runners that night. And so I keep getting beat, keep getting beat. And I see it and I'm, I'm calculating it. They don't show you on the screen, but I'm thinking, okay, if this guy gets here, uh, I think I'm out. So the last runner goes, I'm like, if he finishes, I'm out, I'll be 41st. And so then, uh, he runs, he finishes. I'm like, oh man, well, this was really fun. It was really great. Uh, it turns out I, I had my rankings wrong. I had gotten bumped to 40th. I was the last guy to make it. Seeing a trend here. <laughs> I don't know how to tell yeah. you this, but yeah. Spencer, you're the last, yeah. per, you're dead last, but you're like, but I made the team. Yeah, I yeah. made the team. Exactly. So then, so then I went the next night and I was like, well, this has been the best experience I've ever had. Um, you know, or one of them, it was just 
at, at that time is what it felt like because I because of where I was at. So then I was like, I'm just gonna go hard. I'm gonna just go all out. Like I don't even care if I fall on the first one now. I'm just, I can't even believe I made it this far, you know. Um, cause there's no training really for it at all. There was nothing at the time in Iowa that had it. And the course changes every, every, every like region, like there's no same course and it's obstacles that people have never seen before. There's no standardized obstacles other than the warp wall. So then I just go, you know, like a bat out of hell, I'm just flying and, uh, end up 11th in that, in that, and they took the top, uh, half of that 40 went to the Vegas finals and uh, which was a, like a month later. So and the Vegas finals are televised, right? Those are the ones that all of them are televised. Okay. Yeah. So that there's, yeah, the city, the city qualifier, there's the city finals and then there's the Vegas finals. So then, um, and that's really cool when you make it to Vegas because then they, everything's paid for. And also if you stay in the show, then they pay for things. So then I'm like, great. So they're paying now for my hotel and stuff. And I'm like, awesome. We can get back home. This is wonderful. True. Yeah. So we end up going to Vegas and I'm on this big tour bus of all these athletes going over and they're going to announce the, uh, the run order, you know, who's going. And so they said, I heard a couple of people are just like, and you start to bond with these people because you know, you're with them all through the night. And it's just, it's, it's a, it really is a remarkable experience. It's really, really kind of surreal. And, uh, so then I hear somebody cheering my name and they, somebody slaps my shoulder. I'm like, what, what? And they're like, you're first. Oh like, no. And you haven't seen this, uh, obstacle course yet, right? Nothing. You're, you're getting first blood on the obstacle. Yeah. They, oh kept, my God. they kept us in a tent off site. So we couldn't even look at it to strategize. So really the, the only one that has the biggest disadvantage is first, because then at least you can come back and tell everybody about it. But so I get up there, this is crazy. I get up there and I'm, I walk up this platform and you know, there's cameras and the guy, there's this one guy that always gives you the thumbs up. He's so cool. I mean, that's probably his only job. He's just, I'm just like, <laughs> Yeah. I want to be you. Yeah. I don't even know what you do, but you're awesome. But I get up there and this is all on generators, right? We're out in the desert. I mean, like, like miles from the strip, you can see the strip in the background, but this is a lot that they own. And it's just, we're out there ways. It's 115 degrees out and I'm sitting up there. And then all of a sudden all the lights go off, all the lights, generators go out for 40 minutes. He's like, Hey, just sit up, sit tight, boss. And he's like, like, yeah, and he, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> He's I'm like, just, thumbs down, don't run, oh, don't do it. And I'm just crapping my pants up there like, oh, man. And I'm looking at this. And the obstacle course is really intimidating. I mean, it's like we're starting on these little steps that are going over water. And, you know, it's like one year off by a few inches. It's over. You've come all this way and then it's done, you know. So finally it comes back up and uh, and we start going. And I'm just I'm just going down it. And, and one obstacle, next obstacle, next obstacle, and next obstacle. And I'm making them. And I remember I got into the spider uh, spider wall. It's this giant plexiglass. Oh, and you got to like, yeah, I know. In there. Yep. And I'm, I'm hearing my breath. And all of a sudden you get in there and kind of like the whole noise of the crowd kind of gets uh, blocked out. And I'm just like, I cannot believe I'm here right now. Like, I was just like, I remember thinking that, like, I cannot believe. So I get through there and uh, I get to the next one and you don't know your time. This is the first one you're actually timed on. You have to get there within a certain amount of time. So I get down to like, there's two obstacles left and I see on the jumbotron, I'm like, I'm not going to make it. So I run across these balance steps, really just out of desperation, make them. I may not have made it had I known, had I had more time to be honest with you. So you, you spotted the, there's a countdown clock. There's a giant jumbotron, but you can't see it until you're on the last two obstacles. Yep. It's really for the audience to, to be able to see it really. And, uh, so I get there and I'm on, I go to this, there's this last one called the flying squirrel. And I'm like, I gotta go. And it's this big swing and you let go to this giant cargo net. And you're like, it's gotta be, I mean, you're 30 feet above. I mean, it's a long drop to the water. So I'm like, I'm going to this cargo net as you know, I've got like six seconds just climbing down. I'm like, I'm not going to make it. And then I realize my hands aren't going to make it to that cargo net. So I loop my leg in there and do like this matrix drop backwards. And the crowd does one of those, not like, wow, like, Oh, like just like a, like, like it was a hideous, horrendous fall. Cause and your leg got stuck in and then you're hanging stuck. upside I'm down, hanging upside down. And oh. I'm just like, Oh, you know? And so I end up climbing up there and get to the platform. Timer goes off. 
didn't make the buzzer in time and I was out. But it was like to be first one and they were like full course clear was was a, a big deal at that time to get through all the, the full course, you know, and, and clear it. But, uh, but I remember getting down and she was like interviewing. She was like, Hey, I'm so sorry. You timed out, blah, blah. And I was just like, this was the best experience I've had in a long, long time, a very, very long time. And so it was like, I really, it was one of those things where it was like, it wouldn't have mattered if it went on because I, I felt so, so, uh, just filled up by the experience. It was so, it was so cool. Do, do you feel like that emotional connection was what you were missing from missing the Olympics? Do you feel like that filled that cup in your life bucket that you were just like, I need, I need to feel like I'm the man for like <laughs> one competition to feel yeah. like I've made it. Like all this effort got you to that point. Do you feel like that substitution substituted the void that the Olympics didn't have in your life, man, that's a great question that nobody's ever asked it, asked that or, or put it in those, those words like that. Uh, and yet yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe, yeah, I, I think it was, um, it felt really good to be great at something. Um, and I had, I had, you know, like just personally. And so, yeah, I mean, it was a really, and it was kind of, it was kind of, um, I, how do I phrase this? It was like, it was so perfect to where it was at because all these are about overcoming obstacles. Right. And I, I was doing that. And then not only did I do that in the first round, but then I did it in the second round. And then in the final round, I was able to make it all the way to the end. Like I finished it and whether I hit the buzzer or not, didn't really matter at that point. It was like, I did overcome these obstacles and it really changed the trajectory. I feel like my mentality anyways, for opening the business, because then I came back and I was like, this has to be part of the, uh, of the gym. You know what I mean? And so, um, that just was, and then with my experience there, I brought that into the gym and then those obstacle courses became more than just obstacles in the gym. And so that's what we talked about. That's what I talked about with staff. That's what I talked about with the kids. And it just became, but without that experience, I don't know that it would have been able to relay that message. If that makes sense. Sure. Well, and, and a part of, I mean, that, that was my next question, which I guess answers that is like from the, from the nexus of Emerge Academy, it's like, we're going to have obstacle courses in here. Yeah. Cause like you said, it's teaching kids. There's some weird things you're going to face in life, yeah. like a salmon ladder or yeah. a warp wall or a spider cargo net yeah. launch thing. But yeah. like, you just got to go for it. Like just. Yep go as hard as you can. Yeah. You'll fall many times, but just get up and you can finish it. Cause did, did you, did you feel really accomplished to even have finished the obstacle? Because most people in Vegas wipe out. Oh, it, yeah. it turns it, it goes from American Ninja Warrior to wipe out pretty much. The oh, yeah. announcers could swap yeah. out like, there goes that dude on the mud pit. <laughs> yeah. Punched in the face by the glove of yeah. death or whatever, you know, <laughs> the glove of death. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, I felt, I felt, yeah, I, 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 yeah, it was low. E even though I didn't like win that, I felt like I'd won. Like I remember she was like, I was pretty emotional. Like when she was interviewing me and I was like, man, cause it was like, I just had, it was, I felt like I'd won. And that was really a special thing. And I'd had, I had not felt like a winner. I was not feeling like a winner at that time. And so to have that, uh, little glimmer of little glimpse of hope was like, unbelievably special for me. No, so. I, I love that. This is such a great conversation. We're going to take a pause for a second. Mm -hmm. We're going to do the lightning round here. Oh, cool, so cool. quick, quick fire questions here, just to, to give you a break from all the deep stuff we're yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah. Um, one word answers, whatever, whatever comes to an, uh, your mind here. So um, longest stretch of time you've gone without doing a workout of some kind. Oh, a week, a week. Okay. Like yeah. a vacation or something where yep. you're just like, I'm not doing this. I'm on vacation. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I can't, I mean, unless we're talking about when I was like seven. Sure. But otherwise I, I, I can't. Yeah. Probably I would say a week. That's fair. Um, your favorite gymnastics event to compete in when you were on the circuit. Oh, high bar for sure. Okay. For, for people that don't know to visualize it, it's, it's the, you're spinning, 
You're doing like yep. the handstand hanging onto it, spinning. Then you do like a spinning dismount and stick the landing at the end. Yep. So it's like nine and a half feet from the ground and it's, uh, you know, it's a steel bar, but it's got, you know, it, it, it can bend to it. So it really works as kind of like a spring. So when you go down and, uh, you're swinging around and you let go and you do flips in the air and then you re grab called like release moves. Um, and then, you know, you go for your dismount and it's such a, it's such a thrilling, uh, event and it wasn't my best event by any means, but it is, it's just so fun. And the times where you're in the air and you know where you're at to re grab that small bar and then to do it is like just an unbelievable feeling. Oh, I love it. Yeah. My favorite to watch is the, either the rings cause just mm -hmm. the sheer shoulder strength. I'm like, talk about the weakest muscle group on a to average oh, yeah. person. True. And then these g Olympic gymnasts just have like bowling ball shoulder muscles. I'm like, Jesus, <laughs> like it's, that's always fun to watch. Um, yeah. hardest gymnastics event to compete in that you, that like the thing that you struggled with the most when you were competing. Um, I would say, uh, probably, you know, probably, oh, man, that's tough. I'd say parallel bars was okay. probably, um, you know, and that's like, uh, six and a half. No. Yeah. Six and a half feet off the ground, two bars that are just parallel that are just outside shoulder width. Um, and, uh, I just could never really figure it out. It's just one of those events that I felt like there's not a number that I could do that I could, it's kind of like swimming. Like I've realized now I'm always just going to be great at the doggy paddle. That's sure. it. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's just it. I've accepted that. Well, it's that, like a decathlete. You've got yeah. your good stuff and then you got your, like, yeah. I just got to scrape by on these things and keeps <laughs> excelling. You know, yeah. that makes sense. Yep. Um, what was the hardest aspect of hanging up gymnastics when you, when you came to terms with it? What was the, was it telling people they're like, Hey, how's that going? You're like, well, or what, what was the hardest thing for you, um, in that coping process? I think acceptance, you know, I felt like I'd let down, um, a lot of people in my life, which was not real, was not the case at all. But I felt like, um, at some point I, I felt like I was a beacon of hope for a lot of people that if me, this average Joe could, could, you know, go somewhere that great, then anybody could do it is what I had created in my mind. So I felt like, and, and also in our own household, you know, my sister was struggling with some stuff. My brother was struggling. And so I felt like, I felt like I needed to, to get there to, to show them that they can do it, you know, that they can get there. So I feel like I, I was just accepting the fact that, um, as far as I got was actually was the Olympics. I mean, that was, that was where I needed to get to. And, uh, and because I got short actually changed, changed my perspective on it and made me realize that you can't pursuing something is really where the story's at. It's not the end goal, but it's what you do to get there. And a lot of times, like in my case, it, it helped shape me into who I am today. So now I'm like, yeah, let's chase a dream. What's the worst that's going to happen? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No, I, I love it. I, I just heard this quote the other day where it was, um, people should chase, um, inputs, not outcomes. Yeah. Like if you chase that work ethic, that will pay dividends in your life. And when you got to the final stage, the final, they call it the, the final boss of, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> of whatever it is. Um, the last round of cuts before the Olympic team that you can hang your hat on the fact that you worked your complete effort. Like you worked your ass off until the point where you had nothing left to give. And then you're, then you're like at peace with it. You're like, I've done everything I could do. If this is the outcome, yeah. I'm okay with that. You know, that's always fun. Yeah. I love that. Um, hobby or interests that you have that most people don't know about you. Um, outside of gymnastics or ninja course stuff. Well, I auditioned for the voice, um, and made it past the first round of nice. people before the show. So it's really not that impressive to be honest with you. Um, so it's you and the Korean dude going, she bang, 100%, she bang. Yeah. <laughs> So you beat him. Yeah. No, wait, never mind. He got on TV. Yeah. What, do you, what oh, am yeah. I talking about? No, he, he beat, whooped me. He, he whooped me. Yeah. He got, he got <laughs> albums out. I mean, he went on tour. That guy was the man. Uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, I, I really had started, um, as I was getting close to retiring from the sport, uh, I found out that I really liked doing karaoke, which was really funny. Uh, I was like, man, I really like this. And then I, I started, I won some karaoke competitions. I was like, and I'm, I'm really 
not that great. I'm very average in when you're in a karaoke bar uh, with some liquid courage, everybody sounds good. Oh, sure. Right. That's where I sound the best, you know? So I'm sure, uh, it was like, Hey, this. And so I was thinking, I, maybe this is what I'm supposed to do next. And so I did, I pursued that and it was very short lived, but, uh, it was a really fun experience. Um, and I was very much one little, like little fish in this enormous pond. And there was so many that were really, really good. But, um, yeah, I think I, I would say I'm an avid, uh, car singer. Okay. Yeah. So I, I win karaoke in my car all car the time. Karaoke. Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. What, what was your audition song? What, what were you rocking with? It was come together by the Beatles. Yeah. I have okay. like a, a little rendition that I did of that. And it was, uh, it did not go well. Okay. It was, uh, forgot the words, um, you know, second time. And, uh, yeah, but it was, it, but it was really cool. You should have had really like, fun. um, like a handle in your pocket. Like, hold on, let me just go think of running here. Like chug it, chug <laughs> yeah. some liquor. You're like, okay, I got this now. That like, literally would have helped for sure. Sure. hundred percent. Sure. Yeah. Love it. Okay. That's the end of the lightning round. Cool. Um, we can tie it all together here. Um, a, a question I had as well as when you came back to Des Moines, did the gymnastics scene here influence you guys moving back here? Because there's a lot of like nationally known gyms in the Des Moines. It kinda, it's kind of like a little hub for yeah. people relocate their kids here to yeah. train at a gym to get to that point. Did that influence your guys' choice? For women's gymnastics, for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, it didn't. Not at all, really. Uh, you know, my wife had sacrificed a lot to go on this journey with me. Um, you know, and I'd like to say, you know, it was fun and full of adventure, but it was also filled with hardships as well. Um, but, uh, you know, both of our families are here. And, uh, you know, that's where she wanted to end up. And, and I, and I owed her that. And I also too, you know, I love family is a big deal to me too. So, you know, it wasn't like I was against that either, but, um, you know, there were other offers that we were entertaining, but I think really just being around family. And then when this offer came on, to, came into my, into my lap, I was like, you know, I can make this work and this could be a great, great thing for our family. And, um, so yeah, that's about it. I love it. Um, kind of tying it all together here. Um, I was going to ask, how did being on the athletic train help you run a business? Like going through the the training, the process, the regimented schedule, the discipline, how did that prepare you as a school of hard knocks to become a business owner and learn all the new things that come with that? Well, I think you stated it really. It's, it's, you know, the discipline and, um, you know, the work ethic that you have to have the mindset that you have to have to stay in a sport that long, you know, until you're, you know, mid to late twenties is, uh, especially a sport like gymnastics where it's, you know, it's so heavy on your body and it's, you know, you're trying to do, you're essentially trying to be perfect. You know, you've got to start scoring. You want to be perfect, um, which is impossible, but, uh, the tedious stuff really is draining. And, um, and you really put life on hold for a long time. So you have to really, you have to be driven and you have to have a, a vision of where you want to go or else you, you, you won't survive. And I think taking that into business has been so natural for me because I've, I've done this for almost, you know, I did it for, you know, 17 years. So then to bring that into business, that mentality definitely was, was vital. Then I felt like that was I had it ready because I had been doing that in sport. Sure. For other athletes that are listening, what would be your biggest advice if they're going through an identity crisis, whether they're a really like they're a college athlete that's got to hang it up or they're on the pro circuit and they fall short and they've come to terms with it. What would be your advice if you met someone in that same position as you? I would just say, you know, th this isn't the end. This can just be the beginning. I mean, the stuff I'm doing now, like I love this chapter of my life more than any other chapter I've ever been at. And I think what I've told people before in the past is there's no great story that doesn't come with great struggle. You know, that it, it, every great story has that in, in the story. So this, I think they're just building their, their story right now. And it can be one where they give up and they hang up, or it can be one that they keep going forward and it could be one that people talk about. So the way that they can handle it and the way that they move forward from here, people will be uh, affected by it. And they can either have a great, they can leave a great legacy on people to talk about that and to be motivated by it. Or they can be one where people are like, man, that's one of despair and, you know, one of, of sadness and hardships. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to see it 
outside of where you're at at that point in time. It's hard to take a step back and look into it. I know it was for me. That was very, very difficult. But if they could take a step out and say, all right, look where your life could go. What do you want to do? What are these hardships? What can they lead to? And then to chase something, even if, you know, your parents or your, your coworkers or friends say, this is not, it's not attainable, but maybe that is true for them. But the fact of the matter is they aren't you, you know what I mean? So you can either take those hardships and use them as a tool to help you move forward, or you can take them and use them as a crutch. You know what I mean? Oh, I, I love it. Dude, we could talk so much longer. I, I love your story. This is probably one of my favorite interviews we've done. You're number oh, like 45. So this has been, this has been great. No, no oh, shade to any you, of man. the past people we've that. had on. This has been so great. Where can people learn more about you? Um, learn more about Emerge if their yeah. kids are in the area or if they want to come check out your space, where can they learn more about you? So, um, you know, the gym, we're located off 141 in Grimes, Emerge Academy, you know, emergedsm.com. You can go to our website. Uh, you know, we have adult classes. Um, otherwise I share all my stupid stuff. I still do things that, you know, my mom says is going to get me in the hospital all the time, um, on Instagram, but you can follow me at Spencer dot one team, but, um, that's strictly just for, uh, pure entertainment. Nothing, nothing really of value there. So all the good stuff's at the gym. Sure. Yeah. Sure. No, man, I love this conversation so much. Thank you for coming in. I really yeah, do appreciate you, it. Man, I- and being forthcoming with your story because there's yeah. a lot of a lot of things that you've gone through that I'm sure someone can connect with, can learn from, and, and ruminate a little bit on their story and figure out how to make their next journey. It's not a roadblock; it's just the next chapter. It's like yeah. turning the chapter to the next part of life. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Love it, man. Awesome. Well, if you've made it this far in the show, you know what to do. Make sure to give us a big five star rating if you're listening on iTunes. Subscribe on YouTube or Spotify if you're there. Check us out on social media for other clips, and we'll see you in the next episode. My name is Ryan Snod. It rhymes with odd, and you're listening to Rhymes with Odd. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Thank you so much for watching yet another episode of the Rhymes with Odd podcast. We really do appreciate your support. If you could give us a five-star review on Apple iTunes, that makes a world of difference, guys. Also, if you're tuning in on YouTube or Spotify, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss another episode and check us out on social media. Also, if you'd like to inquire more about our services here at Snod Media Group or learn about doing your own podcast for your own business, you can find us at snodmedia.com. We'll see you in the next episode. Peace.